26-year-old Ying Ying Zhang was last seen in Urbana, Illinois on June 9, 2017. In April, she had moved from China to attend the University of Illinois as a visiting scholar. She had gotten her master's degree in environmental engineering at Peking University and was researching photosynthesis and crop productivity in soybeans and corn at UI. On the day of her disappearance, she was running late to a meeting to sign a lease with the landlord. She was sighted on surveillance footage near the B4 parking garage on North Goodwin Avenue at 2 p.m. Zhang had just gotten off a bus when a black four-door Saturn Astra hatchback pulled up beside her. She had a brief conversation with the driver and then got into the vehicle. She has never been heard from again. The driver of the car that Zhang got into was Brent Christensen, who had earned his master's degree in physics from UI in May of that year. Christensen claimed he let Zhang out of the car a few blocks away. His car was located on June 28th, and on June 30th, Christensen was charged in federal court with Zhang's kidnapping. Authorities learned that on the day Zhang vanished, someone matching Christensen's description had been driving around in a black Saturn Astra, posing as a police officer, and this person attempted to lure at least one more woman into his car. But the woman was suspicious and refused to get inside the vehicle. A forensic examination of Christian's phone revealed he had visited an online fetish forum called Abduction 101 and subforums called Perfect Abduction Fantasy and Planning a Kidnapping. Police also noticed that he had cleaned the car's front passenger door more thoroughly than the other doors and thought he was trying to destroy evidence. In October, Christensen was additionally charged with kidnapping resulting in death. The indictment said he acted in an especially heinous and that it involved torture or serious physical abuse to the victim. The prosecution is seeking the death penalty against him. Christensen attended a vigil for Zhang at the UI campus on June 29th, and his girlfriend did as well, whom the police had convinced to start recording his conversations. She secretly recorded hours of his conversations and later turned them over to the FBI, who was by then investigating Zhang's disappearance. At the vigil, Christensen talked about the sort of person that makes an ideal victim. In another recording, he said he kidnapped Zhang and took her to his apartment, and that she fought and resisted him. He talked about how he hit her in the head with a baseball bat, stabbed her in the neck, and decapitated her. He also claimed he was a serial killer, and that she was his 13th victim, and said she would never be found. In spite of efforts to clean the bedroom with bleach and Drano, police found blood matching Zhang's DNA on the underside of the carpet underneath Christensen's bed, behind the baseboard of the bedroom wall, and on the mattress. They also found a baseball bat stained with Zhang's blood. At Christensen's trial in June of 2019, his defense admitted he killed Zhang, but disagreed with the prosecution as to how and why he did it. His defense argued he was drunk when he made the recorded confession of murder to his girlfriend, and that he suffered from mental illness and should not be executed. Christensen was convicted of murder. The prosecution sought the death penalty, something Zhang's family also wanted, but the jury could not unanimously agree, so the judge sentenced him to life in prison. According to her fiancé, a classmate from Peking University, whom she planned to marry in October of 2017, studying in the United States had been Zhang's longtime dream, and she was enjoying herself while being there. She planned to complete her doctorate at UI, return to China, and take a position as a university professor. She was devoted to her family in China and called her parents every Saturday. She had been accepted at several universities, but chose UI, in part because their financial aid would mean she wouldn't be a burden to her parents. Foul play is suspected in Zhang's case due to the circumstances involved. Sadly, Ying Ying's whereabouts are yet to be solved. Twenty-three-year-old Heather Danielle Teague was last seen sunbathing at Newburgh Beach in Henderson County, Kentucky on August 26, 1995. A witness was observing the beach area through a telescope from across the Ohio River at approximately 12.45 p.m. The witness told authorities that he saw a Caucasian man approach Teague at the time. The abductor allegedly grabbed Teague by the hair and dragged her into the woods off of Newburgh Beach at gunpoint. The abductor was approximately six foot tall and weighed 210 to 230 pounds. He had brown hair and a bushy brown beard. He was wearing jeans and did not have a shirt on. 
He was also reported to be wearing a wig and a mosquito net at the time he abducted Teague. Authorities searched the Newburgh Beach area later in the day and discovered part of Teague's bathing suit near the alleged abduction site. Additional evidence was also located, but nothing investigators found could lead them to Teague's whereabouts. Marvin Ray Dill, a resident of Henderson County, Kentucky, was pulled over in a routine traffic stop after Teague's disappearance. He drove a red and white Ford Bronco, which was identical to a vehicle a witness reported was parked next to Teague's car on Newburgh Beach. Authorities discovered a hair resembling Teague's, two guns, two knives, duct tape, rubber gloves, and a rope in Dill's vehicle at the time of his traffic stop. The truck had bloodstains on the inside tailgate. Dill also strongly resembled the composite sketch made of Teague's abductor. Investigators received several tips connecting Dill to Teague's case in August of 1995 and arrived at his home to question him. Dill reportedly told his wife to leave their residence after becoming alerted to law enforcement's presence before officers could enter the home. Prosecutors compiled available evidence against Dill after his death and brought the information before a grand jury. Another possible suspect in Teague's case is Christopher J. Below, a native of Henderson, Kentucky. He pleaded guilty to attempted involuntary manslaughter in connection with the 1991 death of Catherine Vetzer and is serving a prison sentence of 11 to 18 years for the crime. Vetzer's body has never been found, but Below confessed to shooting her and pleaded guilty to attempted involuntary manslaughter. He's also considered a possible suspect in the disappearances of Mary Kushtu, Shailene Farrell, and Christina Porco. Investigators believe Below may have attacked other women who physically resembled Fetzer. Both Teague and Fetzer had long dark hair and were about five foot tall and 100 pounds. Below was known to be in the general area where Teague was abducted, but shortly after she vanished, on the same day, <laughs> although the witness to Teague's abduction consistently identified Dill and not Below as the kidnapper, authorities believe they have circumstantial evidence to tie Below to the crime. They believe Below and Dill may have done it together. Perhaps one grabbed Teague and the other drove the getaway car. Blow has not been charged in connection with Teague's case, however, due to the lack of conclusive evidence linking him to the crime. In February of 2013, Teague's mother filed a lawsuit against local, state, and federal authorities in connection with her daughter's abduction, alleging maleficence and a cover-up. Her mother claims law enforcement focused on the wrong suspect in Teague's kidnapping and failed to follow up on leads that would have led the investigation elsewhere. The litigation is still pending. Heather Danielle Teague's disappearance remains unsolved and foul play is suspected due to the circumstances involved in her case. 27-year-old Brian Randall Schaefer was last seen at the Ugly Tuna Saluna, a bar near Ohio State University campus, between 1.30 and 2 a.m. on April 1, 2006. He had gone there to celebrate the beginning of spring break with several of his friends and they drank shots at the bar. Security cameras at the bar show him entering the establishment, but never leaving it. He was last seen speaking to two college-aged women inside the bar, and has never been heard from again. Schaefer's car was found parked at his apartment, which was near the Ugly Tuna Saluna, after he had vanished. None of his personal belongings disappeared with him, and his cell phone, credit cards, and bank accounts have not been used since he went missing. Schaefer's loved ones described his disappearance as highly unusual, he was a second-year medical student at OSU at the time of his disappearance, where he made excellent grades in school. He and his girlfriend, also a medical student, were planning a vacation in Miami, Florida for spring break and were scheduled to fly there on April 3rd, two days after he disappeared. His family reported him missing after he missed his flight. Schaefer was in love with his girlfriend and reportedly planned to marry her. His mother died of cancer three weeks before he disappeared. He'd been close to her and was grieving her passing. But his friends and family stated he was not inordinately depressed or In May of 2006, someone broke into Schaefer's apartment. The burglary turned out to be unrelated to his disappearance. Schaefer's father looked in the Olentangy River for his son's remains after he disappeared, but turned up with no evidence. His father was killed in a freak accident in September of 2008. Schaefer's only surviving relative is his younger brother. Authorities do not believe Schaefer left on his own accord, but it's unclear what caused him to disappear. Unfortunately, Brian Randall Schaefer has not been located, and his case remains unsolved.
Sarah Grace Hoggle and Jacob Gabriel Hoggle were very young kids. Sarah was only three years old at the time, and Jacob was only two years old. At the time of their disappearance on September 7, 2014, in Gathersburg, Maryland. Initially, they were both abducted by their non-custodial mother, Catherine Ashley Hoggle. Catherine has had a history of mental illness since she was a child, and was eventually diagnosed with paranoid schizophrenia. In August of 2013, she was involuntarily placed in a psychiatric hospital and was put on medication to help her balance out. After Catherine was released from the hospital, she moved into a group home, but then relocated in with her children's father, Troy Turner. Catherine was enrolled in a day treatment program that was supposed to be her alone and not with her children. On September 7, 2014, while Turner was at work, Catherine and the children were spending time at her parents' house. At around 4 p.m., Catherine used her father's gray 2007 Nissan Rogue and mentioned to her parents that she was going to take Jacob to get some pizza. She left and didn't make it back for about two hours later. Jacob was not with her, and the pizza wasn't with her as well. When asked, she told them that Jacob was at her friend's house, and the parents believed her story. The only problem was Jacob was not there. Catherine's parents brought her and her third child back to Troy's house. Troy had left for work and came home around midnight and realized Jacob was not in his bed, but also noticed that Jacob wasn't home either. Jacob often slept with one of his siblings, and Troy thought that maybe he was sleeping with one of them. The other thing was, young Sarah Grace wasn't home either, and was last seen around 9.30 p.m. The next morning, Troy woke up and noticed that his oldest son was home, but Catherine, Jacob, and Sarah Grace were nowhere to be found. Troy then immediately called 911, and saw Catherine pulling into the driveway. He went outside to confront her about what was going on. She told him that she had taken the kids to a daycare center in Germantown, Maryland. Troy believed her story and told the 911 operator that it was a false alarm and hung up the phone. Troy took Catherine to her treatment program and picked her up at around 2 p.m. He suggested to Catherine that they go pick up the kids at the daycare together. She stated that she couldn't remember the name of the daycare but would direct him on how to get there. On the way there, Troy asked questions, where Catherine was evasive to answer. Getting nervous about the situation, he told her that he was going to the police about it. She casually asked him to stop by a Chick-fil-A first to get a drink, and as they did, Catherine escaped out another door and vanished. Four days later, Catherine was found walking down a street in Germantown, Maryland, wearing the same clothes when she disappeared. The police questioned her about where the children were, and Catherine originally told them that she had left them with an old high school friend named Aaron. She also led police to a playground in Germantown, where she said she abandoned both kids there. Catherine was arrested and charged with misdemeanor accounts of parental abduction, neglect, and hindering a police investigation. She was committed to Clifton T. Perkins Hospital Center, which is a maximum security psychiatric hospital in Jessup, Maryland. Doctors deemed her incompetent to stand a trial. Unfortunately, Catherine hasn't been deemed ever since, and a person who is charged with misdemeanors and who isn't mentally competent to stand a trial can only be held for a maximum of three years. In September of 2017, three years after the children's disappearance, Catherine was charged with two counts of murder. She is still held in the hospital and is still not deemed mentally competent to stand the trial. Although the police believe Catherine murdered Sarah Grace and Jacob, there's no evidence to back it up, or even to indicate the whereabouts of both children. Catherine has told staff that the kids are safe, but continues to keep their whereabouts a secret. Sarah would be 11, and Jacob would be 9 years old if they were successfully found today. Sarah Grace and Jacob Hoggle's disappearance remains a mystery. Nineteen-year-old Brandon Victor Swanson was last seen in Marshall, Minnesota on May 14, 2008. It was the last day of classes at Minnesota West Community and Technical College in Canby, Minnesota, where he was enrolled in a wind turbine program, and he had gotten out with a friend to celebrate. Swanson was on his way home to Marshall when he accidentally drove his car into a ditch, where he got stuck. He wasn't injured in the accident, 
He called his parents on his cell phone at 12.30 a.m. and asked for help. His parents were unable to find him, so Swanson said he was going to walk to the nearby town of Lynn, Minnesota, where he could see lights. He was on the phone with his father while he was walking. Shortly after 2 a.m., Swanson suddenly swore, and the call ended abruptly. His father tried to call him back several times, but he never got an answer. Swanson has never been heard from again. His father spent several hours looking for him, then notified the police at 6.30 a.m. The following day, authorities used cell phone records and located Swanson's car. It was about a mile and a half north of the Lyon and Lincoln County line, off Highway 68 west of Taunton, Minnesota. There was no sign of him at the scene. An extensive search of the area turned up with no sign of him. The car wasn't anywhere near the place Swanson said it was. He had been 20 miles away from there. Apparently he had gotten confused about his location. Although there were some accounts that he had been drinking alcohol that evening, investigators don't believe he was intoxicated or otherwise impaired when he disappeared. Some authorities believe he slipped and fell into the Yellow Medicine River while he was walking in the dark. The river can get pretty deep in some places, and it was running high and fast at that time. Searches of the river didn't produce his body, however, and there's no evidence to support any theory. Swanson is a 2007 graduate of Marshall High School. He had made arrangements to transfer to Iowa Western Community College in Council Bluffs, Iowa, in August of 2008. He planned to eventually enroll into a four-year university and have a career in the sciences. He had worked at a high V food store for four years before his disappearance. Swanson's mother described him as an avid reader with many interests, and he was very devoted to his family. A law made for Swanson called Brandon's Law was passed later in 2008. The law requires Minnesota police to begin an immediate search for missing adults under 21, as well as older adults who are missing under suspicious circumstances. Sadly, Brandon Victor Swanson has never been found, and his case remains a mystery. Three-month-year-old Jana Rivera was last seen in Indianapolis, Indiana on May 28, 2015. She lived with her parents and two older sisters in the 4100 block of Candy Apple Boulevard in the Orchard Valley Farm subdivision. They had moved there just a few weeks earlier. Just before 9 a.m. on May 29th, Jana's mother, Yolanda Rivera Gonzalez, called 911 and said Jana was dead. She later called back and recanted this statement, saying instead that her boyfriend had taken Jana the night before while she was at work and she didn't know where they were. Police later said Yolanda had trouble making herself understood due to a language barrier. Police questioned Jana's father, Jeffrey D. Fairbanks, who is Yolanda's boyfriend, after finding him lying in bed upstairs. He was drunk at the time and he said he couldn't remember much, but that he had picked Jana up and she wasn't moving. He added that he was quote unquote so scared and didn't want to go to jail but wanted to get on with his life. The day after Jana was reported missing, Fairbanks said he would take police to her body. He led them to a dumpster at Mason Garden Apartments on the northeast side of the city. By then, however, the dumpster had been emptied. A few days later after Jana's disappearance, Yolanda filed an order of protection from Fairbanks. In the order, she said Fairbanks had beaten her regularly once a month or so over the past two years, and that he would choke her push her and strike her. On one occasion during an argument, he sprayed her with a fire extinguisher. Yolanda said she had never gone to the police to report the assaults because she was afraid of banks. He was, however, found guilty of domestic battery in connection with a 2013 case involving his then wife. Fairbanks told several stories about what happened to Jana. At one point he said he woke up at 5.30 a.m. to the sound of Jana crying. He gave her a bottle and she drank it and he stayed up for a few hours. He said when he changed Jana's diaper, he put a pillow over her face to muffle her cries. In a letter to the local news media, Fairbanks said he woke up at 1.30 p.m. and realized Jana had died in her sleep, apparently of natural causes. He wrote that in a panic, he wrapped the baby's body in a blanket and took it out to the car because he did not want the other children to see it. It didn't occur to him to call 911, he said. He drove around Indianapolis for eight hours eventually left the body in the dumpster, then lied to Yolanda and his family and said he buried it. 
One of Jana's sisters remembered hearing Jana crying at around noon on the day of her disappearance. She said Fairbanks came downstairs with the baby at 1 p.m., and the other child in the home asked where he was going and why he was carrying Jana like that. The sister caught a glimpse of Jana's face, and her eyes were closed. Fairbanks then took Jana out to the car, left and did not return for eight hours. When he came back, he was drunk and crying and said that she was dead and he couldn't save her. Jana's sister stated Fairbanks was careful with Jana when he was sober, but when he drank a lot, he would yell at Jana and hit her when she cried and fussed. He also sometimes covered her face with a pillow to get her to stop crying. In August of 2015, Fairbanks was charged with murder and neglect of a dependent causing death. In April of 2017, after less than two hours of deliberation, a jury found him not guilty of murder, but guilty of neglect of a dependent causing death. He was sentenced to 30 years in prison. An extensive search of Indianapolis, in fields, ponds, and landfields in Shelby Hancock in Marion counties turned up with no sign of Jana's remains. Although police did find a bloodstained blanket, and Yolanda identified it as her daughter's. Sadly, three-month-year-old Jana has never been found. Foul play is suspected in Jana's case due to the circumstances involved. Thirty-year-old Stephen Thel Kosher was last seen leaving his residence in St. George, Utah on December 12, 2009. The following day, he spoke to two of his friends on a cell phone and said he was in Las Vegas, Nevada. Being a devout Mormon, Kosher offered to turn around to cover a church meeting for one of his friends, but his friend said not to worry about it. Stephen Kosher was never heard from again. On December 14, 2009, Kosher's white 2003 Chevy Cavalier was found abandoned in a cul-de-sac in the 2600 block of Savannah Springs Avenue in an upscale residential neighborhood of Henderson, Nevada. A video surveillance camera in the area showed him parking the car and leaving it there on December 13th. He walked down the sidewalk, crossed the street, and walked out of the frame. He was alone and didn't appear to be disoriented. It appeared as if he had a destination in mind and had parked in the location for a reason. Kosher shaving kit, coats, pillows, and blankets were inside the vehicle as well as Christmas gifts he'd purchased a few days before, but his cell phone, wallet, and driver's license were missing. His laptop and cell phone charger were left back at his home. His car had a half tank of gas in it when he left. About five hours after Kosher left his car, his cell phone signal pinged up at a tower several miles away, near Arroyo Grande Boulevard and American Pacific Drive. Two hours after that, the signal pinged in the subdivision near Sunset Drive and Stephanie Street. Early the next morning, someone checked Kosher's voicemail, and the signal was picked up by a US-95 in Russell Road. The phone stayed at that location for two days before the signal was completely lost. It's unclear why Kosher traveled to Nevada. He is originally from Amarillo, Texas, and graduated from Amarillo High School in 1998, where he went on to graduate from the University of Utah. He had been living in Salt Lake City, Utah, and working for the online division of the Salt Lake Tribune, but he quit his job and moved to St. George in April of 2009. His family stated he was having trouble finding a job and may have gone to Las Vegas to seek employment. He did not drink alcohol or use because he was true to his religious beliefs. There was speculation that Kosher's disappearance was connected to the December 2009 disappearance of Susan Powell, who was last seen in West Valley City, Utah on December 7th. Because Kosher was about the same age as Powell, it disappeared from the same state at approximately the same time. Investigators looked into the possibility of their disappearances being linked. Powell's husband actually suggested that they had run away together, possibly to Brazil, where Kosher had been there before, on a missions trip. Authorities found no connection between the disappearances, and no evidence that the two of them knew each other, however. Kosher's parents stated that there was no indication that or plan to walk out of his life and authorities can't find any evidence of foul play either. He was having financial problems at the time of his disappearance due to his unemployment, but his loved ones don't know what could have caused him to vanish. Both Utah and Nevada police are investigating Stephen Kosher's disappearance, and his case remains a mystery. One-year-old Ayla Bell Reynolds 
was last seen at 8 p.m. on December 16, 2011, when her father, Justin DePietro, put her to bed in their home on Violet Avenue in Waterville, Maine. She apparently vanished during the night and has never been seen again. Her father called the police at 8.50 a.m. the next morning. Justin, his sister, his girlfriend, and the women's two children were at the residence all night. The night Ayla vanished. Authorities maintain the baby's father has not been cooperative with the investigation, and they believe the adults who were in the home that night are withholding information. Investigators found Ayla's blood in multiple places in Justin's home, including her first floor bedroom and his basement bedroom, which is where he slept that night with his girlfriend and her child. His sister and his sister's child slept on the first floor. There was about a cup of blood in total, and evidence that someone had tried to clean up the stains. Ayla's mother, Trista Reynolds, was in a 10-day substance abuse treatment program when her daughter disappeared. The day before Ayla went missing, Trista had filed for sole custody. Ayla had been placed with her father by the Maine Department of Health and Human Services two months prior to her disappearance. Justin did not know about Trista's custody bid. In April of 2012, police found unspecified items of interest behind the Hathaway Creative Center in the Kennebec River, about a mile from DePietro's home. In May of 2012, nearly six months after Ayla vanished, authorities publicly stated that they believed she was dead, but did not believe that she had been abducted. Ayla was declared legally dead in 2017. The court recorded that she had died around the time she was reported missing. In December of 2018, seven years after her disappearance, Trista filed a wrongful death suit against Justin. Although the suit seeks unspecified monetary damages, she stated the real goal of it was to get answers as to what happened to Ayla and to recover her body. Justin maintained his innocence in his daughter's case and stated he had no idea where she was. In his response to Trista's filing, Justin said he was innocent of any wrongdoing in Ayla's disappearance and the blood in his house was from one time when she was sick. In 2022, the wrongful death suit was expanded in scope. Justin's mother, Phoebe DiPietro, and sister, Alicia DiPietro, were both added as defendants. Based on unspecified new evidence, Trista alleges the women played a role in Ayla's death and in the subsequent cover-up. Unfortunately, no one has been named as a suspect in Ayla's disappearance. Ayla Bell Reynolds remains missing to this day. Covering these cases was pretty rough on me. It's sad seeing people trying to live out their daily life with a whole future in front of them to then just get taken out of existence in the blink of an eye. When I look at the faces of these individuals, I see life and happiness. It just sucks knowing that they're out there somewhere. If you or anyone know anything about the cases talked about today, please contact your local law enforcement. Any information you're able to provide would be an incredible help for these people trying to find closure. I also don't condone any harassment towards any of the individuals talked about in these videos. It's not good for you, not good for anyone, so please don't. Thank you for watching, stay safe, and I'll see you in the next one.